Hey guys, what's going on? Uh, we're at two o'clock. Got a two o'clock presentation here. Uh, two new guys, so please give them a good uh, you know, celebration. <laughs> They'll be fine. I mean, come on. Um, the, pr the presentation is called Sparrow, a novel covert communication scheme exploiting broadcast signals in LTE, 5G, and beyond. Wow, everything. Uh, and the presenters are uh, Raza Shakabi and Chuck McCauley. Did I mess it up? I still messed it up. I'm so sorry. Uh, I guess this is oh, this is life. But um, can you guys start off? Thank you, everybody. Uh, nice time afternoon for attending our talk here. I'd like to present a novel covert communication scheme exploiting broadcast signals, LTE, 5G, and beyond. And I add something in this presentation today, since you guys are attending in person, be different than what we have recorded and posted on YouTube. So give a hint, it's about exploiting mobile towers for stealth IoT. So I would like to introduce yourself. I'm Reza Susahabi. I have my Twitter handle up there. So I come from the uh, background in math and signal processing. I'm application uh, research lead at Application and Threat Intelligence Center at Keysight. We call it ATI Research Center. So I do 5G security research and uh, make algori algorithms for making and breaking things. So and always I um, have a great experience whenever I try something for the first time. That's a picture of my childhood. I, I suck at riding horses, but that first time I looked like Napoleon, so it came nice. <laughs> so here with me, I have Chuck. McCauley. Thanks, Reza. Um, my name's Chuck McCauley. I go by Noble Trout as well. Um, this is uh, the countless next DEF CON I've ever been to, but it's the first time I've made it to the main stage. Um, what I really want as a life goal is to become a ski bum. Uh, but uh, in my day to day stuff, I work with Reza. We break a lot of things. Uh, we work for a test and measurement company, so you get to test and measure quite a lot of things and think about new ways of breaking things. So there you go. All right, so I want to take a moment here and talk about motivation because what I'm presenting here is not just about. Uh, discovering a single vulnerability in the standard of all the 5G and LT towers that are deployed down there, but it's more of a, like an idea that can be applied to other wireless technologies. So to do that, I really would like to summarize this, that what this research is product of having a right vision, uh, being a right, in the right time and the right place, and today I'm honored to presenting to the right people here. So I've been working uh, on IoT security research. I published in IEEE around like 2013, 14, and I left my PhD to join industry to get my hands more on experience and try to find better ways to apply mathematics to problems. So I work as an R&D consultant with mobile operators in US, and I was a 5G system engineer a while before joining Keysight. So I was away from security for almost seven years. So when I joined ATI, I had the opportunity to kind of get formal education in InfoSec and learn about things that are going on down there that are lesser known to people in the wireless world like myself. So that was a key point here, and these is also a product of basically merging my past and present experiences. Another key point here was our um, support that I received from our organization, particularly our cool boss, Steve here, that one day invited me uh, to an unspecified room in our building and said that, hey, this is a lab with a super expensive uh, cell site emulator there said that do find what's wrong with it and do 5G security research here, Greenfield. So I decided to uh, go after something big, so get motivated for that to go after not simulating what is already out there but what can be the future vulnerability. And of course, we, we disclosed this in fall, to, I mean, we discovered this in fall 2019, but we went through the responsible disclosure with uh, GSMA, which is the association of all mobile operators and OEMs. 
And things got slow. I was on parenting leave and the pandemic. So I, got, I watched, by the way, on first time also attending DEF CON in person. So I watched the, this uh, very awesome talk on eavesdropping satellite signal in the last year DEF CON. And I got really excited and I just realized that, okay, this work has to be for the first time presented at the DEF CON. So what was the approach I've taken here to discover uh, this kind of vulnerability, or I'm going to call it like a class of vulnerability, was basically taking a holistic approach and putting everything in a big picture and figuring out what is the missing piece in there. So I realized the covert communication, uh, a little bit, uh, the wording is a little bit heavy, but it's a big umbrella that can cover data exfiltration, which is very known in the infosec industry, not much too much known in the wireless world, and all sort of unauthorized communication, and it is a considered a potential threat. We know that it's a part of many kill chains, and it's a matter that has to be treated uh, for defense in depth. So when I was reviewing the literature, I realized that there are two dominant viewpoints from two different types of people. So we have uh, hackers and people in the infosec uh, that have focused on, I mean, that's their mentality to exploit uh, software protocols and have done a great job of uh, finding ways to tunnel messages in layer three to seven protocols like IC ICMP tunneling, DNS tunneling for data exfiltration, those are very classic ones. But however, there is a problem with doing that because the uh, InfoSec industry is actively monitoring the research in this area and they develop countermeasures. So, and everything that gets to the internet, goes to the IP world, we know that uh, it's gonna get cached somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, so they find ways to block it or mitigate the impact of them. On the other side, mostly in academia, uh, people who work on a, from the engineering background, they have the mentality to build things from scratch. So they are so much fascinated building an optimal radio for covert communication. So the big of the focus has been on building a new radio physical layer. And particularly, they have to use low power for that because they want to stay stealth. So a high power transmission is gonna basically expose where the, the radios are. And there is a problem with that approach too because those type of radios, because of the operational power they have, they do not work in an environment where one end is indoor, the other end is outdoor because the RF signal is going to get blocked with multiple trees and buildings. Basically, we call them clutter. So when I put these things together, probably you've noticed by the, by the areas that I've kind of blacked out, you see that I said, that, okay, how about Mac layer? I didn't find anything in there from either side. So I come up with this idea, said that, okay, let's merge both mentalities here. How about we start finding a way to exploit the Mac layer standoff, standard of the wireless infrastructure that has been already deployed out there for all sort of covered communication. And this is basically the question that is driving this talk is all about. And definitely we're going to basically see that we're going to gain some advantages where the existing methods are failing. So also this talk is very related to the theme of this DEF CON this year. Uh, you cannot stop the signal and I want to call it like exploiting unstoppable signals if I'm going to put this in three words. So we are right now seeing that like a Basically, right now, we are kind of overwhelmed with signals from all the cellular towers and mobile operators and satellite, in addition to, like, you know, local area network, like a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and et cetera. So what makes those signals basically unstoppable? It, that why, if we deploy Wi-Fi here, basically the coverage sucks if we go outside the building, but why the towers are up there? And that's the height. So they spend big money to put the antennas high up on towers, and also recently some companies are flying them on satellite because the height will give you advantage, a clear radio signal path to many users in a wide area. So moving forward, how this new, what is the, basically if we're gonna put it um, in a way to describe this whole thing that's gonna apply to any of these type of technologies, I would like to present this scenario, this hypothetical scenario moving forward. So consider Trudy has intruded 
a secure air gap building with a programmable low power radio or software defined radio. And would like to smuggle some messages to her counterpart, Ricky, which is sitting a couple of miles away in an in, you know, undisclosed place outdoor. And the, of course, there is no clear radio path between them to transmit signal, and there isn't, they cannot access the network in there to smuggle using the network protocols. However, definitely they're going to be receiving signal from a cell site nearby, cell tower, and they can send and receive signals to it. So this talk is about what if Trudy finds a way to create a set of signals in the protocol standard that tower is operating so that it can send those low power uplink signals to the tower and the tower omnidirectionally broadcast it everywhere so that Ricky, a few miles away, can decode those signals and basically figure out what signal Trudy was sending. So that way they can create a virtual communication channel between them. If I'm going to give an analogy for this to remember, it's like a Batman movie. So they, they didn't know bad where Batman is, right? So they were like reflecting the light of the sky to make it visible everywhere. And that's what, how we are exploiting the tower because it has a high power so they can broadcast the signal everywhere, can be received everywhere around this coverage area, pretty much. So I would like now to um, talk about the example that I've discovered in LTM 5G, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot like this talk to motivate people to go after other wireless protocol, but LTM 5G was kind of my bread and butter for a while. And this is the, uh, the CVD code that we disclosed with the GSMA. So talking about that, we need, I'm going to just brush up quickly on the protocol stack uh, for the people who are coming from the wireline because this talk is going to also be uh, motivating for them, hopefully. So when we're talking about protocol stack, they always like crank up from bottom to the top. That's how I, my teachers used to explain it. It means that in every layer, there is some initialization handshakes happen right way before it starts transferring data from the top layers. So when we're talking about Mac layer or layer two, um, maybe the easiest example of that that everybody knows about is Ethernet. So whenever you connect the Ethernet cable to a port on a switch, right before the lights start breaking green, there is a bunch of like synchronization and handshake messages get exchanged that nobody cares about. So essentially in this work, we're going to show that how you can exploit the equivalent of those messages in LTM 5G. Boom. Big Mac. Huh? <laughs> I'm glad that I got this after the before. If this talk was before launch, probably I would have lost half of audience, right? Get hungry. <laughs> so the, the things are a little bit convoluted uh, when we're talking about the 5G and LTE standard because here I'm using the Mac layer or layer 2 in a most general sloppy way that you can imagine. It's whatever layer that handles the IP traffic from the user devices. So I know this might be for people who are in this area, this might be a little bit of abomination, but that's fine. So, so whenever you turn on your phone and search up for a signal, right, the first thing that the phone does essentially is that it tries to find attached to a tower. And then all the SIM card would stop kicking and your phone starts exchanging some authentication messages with a lot of core, core servers, uh, servers in the core network of your operator. So that's because there are so many components in the mobile operator LTE and 5G networks, that's what you have all those uh, delicious sub layers down there <laughs> inside the Big Mac. So all, each of them does something in there and related to that. But that's not what our talk is going to be about today. We are going to focus uh, on the one layer, we call it RRC. <laughs> so that layer means that it just uh, is, is a context that tracks the state of a UE, whether you are connected or not connected. And the first thing that the UE does or before connecting in here to the cell tower is that it does a random access. And there are some handshake happening down there that is local between the phone and the tower right before any other authenticated handshake happen and never get logged everywhere in the network. And that's what we were trying to exploit here. So some quick terminology notes in here is that I probably mentioned it by accident, UE user equipment. So in the context of cellular, we call anything that interacts with the cell sites uh, user equipment, UE, can have SIM card, cannot have a SIM card, whatever it is. And the fun story of the Node B that comes from the essentially the GSM. So in LTE, they call this cell tower 
call them E node B, enhanced node B. And then in 5G, they start calling them G node B. And I was talking to Chuck about this. And then he said, what happened to the F node B? And I said, maybe they didn't like to use it. But throughout this call, I'm going to use F node B to refer to both of them, both type of the E node B and G node B, because this vulnerability applies to both of them. So this is a normal random access procedure, which is very common in most wireless standards. So there are a set of like a preamble signal, designated signals uh, that all the towers or, or F node Bs are responding to, waiting for new UEs to come and trying to connect to them, no matter they have a SIM card or doesn't have a SIM card, whatever. So there are a bunch of like initial plain text messages, four messages that are exchanged before even the SIM card kicks in and authentication session happen. And that's actually where most of the attack vectors on the LTF have taken place so far. So message one, it sends a basic random signal from a limited set and then the it, it, F node B replies with more synchronization configuration parameters. Those are not the important ones. But then standard requires the phone to do a contention resolution. So what is contention resolution? It is where there is always a chance that two phones, two UEs at the same time try to pick up the same preamble signal and send one message one. But only one of them is gonna make it to the tower. And so the tower has to have a way to tell other phones to back off and then only one of them they can succeed. So they don't kind of resolve the race condition. So the standard requires the phone to randomly pick a 40 bit value and embed it in their, in the message three and send it to the tower and the tower is gonna respond immediately back and the phone checks what it receives with the tower if message four, if the message four in comes back is the same as much as message three that the UE has sent, sends that okay, I've been selected. If not, I have to back off. So that's the procedure that happens in there and happens very quickly and no encryption, nothing happens down there. So probably, probably you've realized so far that how this thing can be exploited, that four debit message, right? So here is how the Trudy and Ricky are going to exploit that. So they decide what basically frequency and tower they wanna use and what preamble signal that Trudy would like to use the first one. And then Ricky is passively listening to message two and message fours. But Trudy, instead of picking a random value, what it does, it encodes a message in there and puts the encoded message in there and sends up and the F node B immediately broadcasts everywhere. It's omnidirectional. And then it gets received and decoded by Ricky. So that's how they establish their virtual communication channel between each other. So they can repeat these in multiple attempts in fact because per standard, um, they can, if, if Trudy has a larger message, can break it down to multiple four digit messages and repeat it. And the standard uh, requires the phones to pick up a back of value if they want to successively attempt this, but it's up to the phone. And phone, at this stage of the random access, the tower even doesn't know where the phone is. So they cannot enforce anything. So we can say that uh, Trudy always picks the minimum value, which is 10 milliseconds. And in LTE, that message one to message four normally takes uh, 30 milliseconds. So the total throughput that they can establish to have is on average one kbps, which is comparable to what you can get in LoRa as well for some sort of IoT communication. So the range wise, this vulnerability is better to be used in the lower frequencies. So it existed now over a decade. It started with LTE release eight. So we can get almost um, around like a five miles depending on a frequency range that you use, but it's more suitable for the frequency ranges FR1, that's now defined in 5G2, uh, below six gigahertz, because when 5G also introduced some millimeter wave, but there is lots of RF magic and beam forming and stuff happen down there. That is gonna make it difficult for Ricky to decode signals. And another case that might actually make this more impactful is 5G non-terrestrial network standard that is in development right now. So that's kind of like flying the F node Bs over the air and creating a satellite mesh network up there. And so that is going to increase the range for the Sparrow from maybe five miles to maybe 50 or 100 miles. So hopefully we have a remediation that we are proposing for that. 
So kind of summarizing it, why Sparrow, why I call this a Sparrow, it's going to be clarified now <laughs> quickly, is that essentially what compare this back to the, the existing covert combination techniques that I mentioned early on. So there is no network footprint here. So essentially these messages never get logged anywhere. It's just between the phone and the F not B. And there is no spectrum footprint either because the Trudy phone is not gonna be distinguishable from any other phone. So there is no way it can be like, like triangulated and so it's just targeting Mac layer. Another thing is a low hardware complexity. So they can be like built with the SDRs I've pointed down here below that you can see. Um, so there are already open source libraries for LTE and 5G called SRS RAN and the SDRs, there are many companies make them uh, in the range of like below thousand dollar. You can buy them and a small form factor. So another thing is you don't need a large antenna. So compared to the ham radio or walkie talkie or any other devices, if they want to get five mile range, you need high power. But these are transmitted at the same power level, which is 0.2 watts as the phones that are in our pockets. So, and so that they can basically live off the rechargeable batteries and harvest energy. And that's what, that's one of the reasons I call them Sparrow because they can survive everywhere. And the last reason to call them Sparrow is once we disclose this to the mobile operator responsibly, they realized that this is not going to have much of an impact on the other user devices. So they said that uh, categorizes as a kind of like a, not a very severe vulnerability. So we can, it's open for people to use it and nobody cares about them. Like a sparrow is the bird that nobody cares about them among, you know, in the <laughs> bird kingdom. So, <laughs> but it is open and it's not, it's going to be basically open because there's a fault in the standard and blocking this would, need some changes to the standard. So I will say that thing might take maybe three to five years to be even remediated. So now I will not turn the podium to my colleague Chuck to talk about our demo and some of the applications and what you can do with this power. -up. Thanks Reza. Um, so I, I think you guys all know that but there's a bug going around recently um, and being able to uh, do this sort of research can be get much more complicated when you work at a large company and there's a lot of stuff all over in different places in the universe of our company. So what you're looking at here is a demo lab set up in Italy by our peers uh, that basically helped us walk through going from theory into concept to prove that this was actually going to work. Um, at the bottom you see a tool that we call a UXM and that's a cell site emulator. It allows you to emulate a uh, F node B um, or, and then you can control all the messaging and signals uh, with it uh, when uh, attaching say your iPhone for testing or you want to test a new LTE chipset or something, right? Um, above it, we have the opposite tool which is we call UE SIM and that emulates uh, uh, UEs connecting to a cell phone tower. So if you're Ericsson and you make a cell phone tower, you're going to want to use that tool to emulate thousands of phones connecting to your tower and make sure that you can support it. But you can also put them both together to each other and test out theories on messing around with the uh, RRC message connection requests, right? Um, I think I mentioned this lab got set up in Italy. That's because that's where the predominant effort for all that engineering is. And it's a bit hard to get all this gear in one place to dedicate to doing something. So when we started working on a demo for this, we quickly realized that we needed to rope in additional guys and we got our main man Befe over in Italy to record a quick video uh, proving out that this works. Um, so now you guys get treated to a little four minute vignette of uh, Befe showing this. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what our current efforts are right now and trying to make this a lower cost sort of solution. If I can find the mouse. I'm doing this live so I hope it works. I'm an application engineer at Kisai Technologies. In this video, I am going to demonstrate the proof of concept for the Sparrow project. With this uh, mosaic graphical user interface, we configure UA on ELSUA, that's with an IP address of 1048870 as a TX. 
Therefore, we set the mode as a TX and the random access preamble ID to 8. And the, mess, the plain text message to be sniffed by the receiver UE is set to welcome to the DEF conf. Similarly, we have set the UE B on ALSUB with an IP address of 10.14.88.157 as an RX. Therefore, we set the mode to RX and the random access preamble ID to 8. On the current network side, the, fair, the PRT script activated the 5G LR standard load cell where the synchronization signal block is broadcasted via the EXM platform with a periodicity of 20 milliseconds. If the master information block is decoded with success on both uh, UE, so the cells will get sync and in service if the system information block type 1 is uh, decoded. Since both UE are in, in service, in, in sync and idle, we can connect the GUI to the layer 3 test manager and verify if the SIB is decoded, then the cell should get in service. We can run the scenario from the RX side first now and from the TX side. It seems that the transmitted message is with success on from the TX side and let's verify if the receiver UE side decode the message successfully. So from the scenario logger, here we have decoded that uh, the message welcome to the DEF conference. From the TX side, it can be verified that uh, the message too is uh, decoded with the valid RAR. Also on the RX side, uh, we can check The message too is decoded with the, the valid R as of uh, uh, TX uh, UE. If this is the case, we can also verify the message through 3 is decoded with success first from the uh, TX side. So here we can confirm that the UE contention resolution ID is decoded with success on the TX side and uh, let's see also on the RX side. So on the RX side, message tree is also decoded with success. So since we have implemented a CRC decoding, if the message is decoded, we can see the message on the RX side. So, as you can see, the message is decoded successfully. Welcome to the DEF conf. Right. So that's a lot to take in, right? Um, but the uh, reality is, is at the end of the day, is we use that to prove out that this worked. Um, there's a lot, honestly, going on in there, um, but. That, that's how it goes. You basically saw one as a transmitter, it sent messages. They were 40 bits, so it was multiple ratch messages that were sent, and then the other one decoded them uh, sequentially and put, stitched them back together again, which is pretty cool. So when we talk about some of the application scenarios that this can imply, you've got sort of your good, the bad, and the ugly. The bad is clearly that you now have an overlay network where you can pass messages from one place to another, uh, effectively hiding in plain sight. Everyone's phone here is sending these messages, not all the time, but if you turned it on and then back on, if you turned it off and back on again, it would be beaming it out. So you can effectively now have, you know, a, a five mile radius of sending and triggering signals anywhere you want. Um, this allows you to do all sorts of fun, nefarious things. If you start thinking more creatively, um, you can use it for command and control, or you can use it for data exfiltration. 
or you can even use it as a sort of a part of a supply chain attack where you bake in remote access commands into your phone and trigger them if you send the right set across the tower. However, on the good side, um, this is a rather interesting solution for, say, uh, natural disaster failover scenarios, being able to connect two parties together and get important messages across to them when the, what's normally called the backhole or core network data network fails. Um, you still can actually make use of a cell phone tower now to pass messages between uh, first responders or just do citizen notifications. And then finally for the mischief makers among us, uh, you can now make yourself your own little party channel. Um, if you see down here on the lower left, uh, this is uh, courtesy of um, I think his name's Scott on uh, Twitter. I saw this device at ShmooCon, it was really cool. Um, but you'll notice that he has a big giant antenna on there. It's, it's uh, called Dirt Simple Communications and it's a custom RF setup that leverages LoRaWAN LoRa -WAN to communicate. Um, started talking to him about this and he's like, wait a minute, I don't even need an antenna really. I, I can just curl a little wire inside if I use it, right? Um, uh, the same thing is you could also use this as a replacement for other IoT based protocols and uh, if you didn't mind falling afoul of the CFAA or wire fraud or anything else, uh, you could just use, you know, some service provider cell phone tower as your means of getting your IoT devices to talk to each other. <laughs> um, and now I'm going to hand it back over to Reza again for the rest of the show. All right, so I would like to talk about a little bit of a range extension. We know that like um, we have a more mileage with these per watts compared to a lot of existing technologies, but we don't have to stop there because when we're talking about most areas, there is not only one cellular tower. There are many cellular towers from different mobile operators. So that Ricky and Trudy can multi basically exploit both of them to create in parallel uh, communication channels, so that way they can boost their throughput above 1 kbps if they want to. Or they can, because this device is operating very low power on rechargeable batteries on solar panel, they can deploy these what I call the relay networks uh, nodes. So these are acting like Ricky in one cell and Trudy in the other cell, so receiving a message and relaying it and repeating the same process in another, with another cell side. So they can extend the range. So you can, um, of course, there's going to be some more delay, but nothing stops you to basically go with several hops to miles and miles and miles with this. So this was one of the areas that actually GSMA had certain questions. So I put together this clarifying thing for people who are in the cellular and RF, they're familiar with this map called a sector map. So that shows that what every cell site, what is their coverage area, different color. So as you can see, the relay nodes can be deployed at the basically overlap areas between multiple cell sites. So they can send and receive between multiple of them. So you can have a mesh or you can relay message from one, a, one end to the another end. So now I'm going to start talking about remediation. I'm not sure if anybody here <laughs> are impaired, uh, interested in remediation. So I know people might be excited to try this. But before doing that, I would like to present the general weakness model. Uh, there's going to be some paper I'm trying to publish on possibly an archive uh, a little bit after the con that's going to have all the details. But in case that uh, people who would like to go after these in other wireless standards uh, kind of put together this four conditions that will indicate that a wireless Mac layer protocol standard is vulnerable to similar techniques. So that would require essentially to, so that the Ricky and Trudy can build a code book. So their code book is a M, basically it's a set of messages, uplink low power messages, and that is going to trigger uh, another set of B broadcast messages from the cell side. So here in case of LTE that what we discovered, B and M are identical, right? Because the tower is just rebroadcasting exactly the same thing. But if some people want to do PhD on this, they can go very fancy with math and find a way that how you can still explore it in many scenarios. So the condition number one is the passive reception. So basically the signal that gets broadcast has to be kind of omni. There shouldn't be much out of voodoo stuff in there so it can be decoded everywhere. Another one is one-to-one -one relationship between this so that 
the receiving end, when it receives one signal, it can be almost sure that what was the original uplink signal that was transmitted from the code book. The third one is the is a good to have, and we have it in the example, but it's not necessary, is anonymous uplink. So essentially the transmitter end doesn't have to associate with the network or disclose its identity to send these signals, which is the case. So that way it can stay stealth forever. And the last one is stateless uplink, which they can do it successively without violating the standard. And we had all these four conditions in the simplest way satisfied with the example that we just talked about. So to remediation for this, first we need to understand that what is happening here in the random access procedure and what is the goal of CRI because it's a very common process, it's many wireless standards. So the, the whole purpose of the CRI, as, we, as I mentioned, was that two phones simultaneously attempting and picking the same preamble signal so that one of those signals is going to be received, but the tower has to basically tell one of them to back off. And at that point, there is no identity. So it lets them to select their own identity and ping pong the tower and based on that basically figure out whether they should proceed or not to proceed. Uh, so whatever remediation that we do, it has to preserve the functionality of the CRI. We don't want to create performance headaches for the normal users, right? And the culprit is not the uplink part, message three, is mostly message four. So that's the message four that gets broadcast, goes everywhere. So that's the message has to be protected. So there are a couple of things, basic remediations that I uh, want to present here that do not work before I get to the one that works. So one is that, okay, how about we make the use not to pick randomly, like have it something like a MAC address that has been pre-configured or some ID, fixed ID unique that they can use every time. Well, I think there are people that is still at DEF CON presenting calls on MZ caching and stuff, so there is a lot of privacy issues with that. And these can turn into a, basically a way to track users if they always pick the same CRI value because you can track them always based on the broadcast. Another one is um, the, the E-Node business start like a tracking and blocking this. It's very hard because there is always a chance of a, like a false positive and you're blocking the ratch attempts from the normal users. So there is a cost associated with that. So, and another one is probably many people's favorite uh, crypto. So even if we use a crypto with the salting on message three, this is the operation that the the F node B does to produce message four. So instead of replaying back, hash it and send the hash. But that is going to be a problem in there because there is no shared secret here. So you have to ship the salt as well so that the UE compute. So essentially, Ricky can basically create a rainbow table, table here and pre compute the hash value for all the possible messages in their code book and it's still decoded. So it's a little bit hard computationally, but it still, it doesn't prevent it. So what we really need to prevent is introducing error. That's what wireless engineers always are fighting, trying to create communication schemes that prevent error. But here we are going to introduce error for Ricky and Trudy so they cannot communicate. So what we do here is that we take the output of the salted hash function and of course there is a new basically salting techniques that have come up here I will discuss it in my paper called multiplication salting is for getting a good uh, low collision probability with short strings because here we are talking about like a 4D to 48 bit strings and then start randomly erasing bits so basically the F node bit doesn't broadcast all the bits it randomly selects a set of bits and broadcasts those. But of course, for the CRI to work with normal users, it has to tell them that what bits it has selected. So it has to ship also a bit mask indicating what bits are selected, what bits got erased. So the normal UE is probably going to be handling this. They have basically, they have the salt, they have the bit mask, so they can recompute the same thing and compare it and they can function as always. But for Ricky, it's going to be very difficult <laughs> because to recover the messages, to figure out what message it has transferred, it, they have to build a code book that once it passes through the salted hashing, it has error correcting capabilities. 
So I think that one is going to be a very hard problem practically to solve. And that's the whole point we rely on because you cannot have a code book, a rainbow table that you can control it to be error correcting for you. So here I would like also to get some wrap up points here with Chuck. With me, Chuck, do you want to join me here? Some concluding bits here. Go ahead, Chuck. Um, so just a few things to take away and I'm, almost, I'm, I'm sort of echoing uh, uh, what uh, Ian said this morning at her, uh, her talk. Um, really sort of bring in people with different perspective into your teams. Um, I'm an IP networking kind of guy. Um, low level layer protocols, Mac. Um, Reza came to me, he's like, I think I got something here with Mac layer. I'm like, Mac, you mean like Ethernet on a switch? Like, that's really boring. And he's like, no, 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 it's over wireless. So everyone gets to see it. I'm like, oh, right. Okay. So uh, that, that's sort of where that idea sort of came from to begin with. Um, also, re utilize lateral thinking. Remember that, like, to get from point A to point Z, you don't always have to go through points B through Y. And sometimes you're, box that you're concerned with navigating around might not even be the problem that you want to think outside of, near, around, or whatever. Just, you know, look in a different direction. Um, we also really don't think that LTE and 5G are the only protocols that are going to be um, exposed to this type of vulnerability. Um, we're, we, we haven't looked at any others, but there's always going to be some kind of contention resolution that has to occur between two nodes to agree to talk. Um, so we're going to start looking at other wireless protocols that also enable this, and we encourage you to as well. Um, and the last one is uh, just to bring your awareness that pretty much anyone now, for a few thousand bucks, can build their own 5G network uh, legally and safe. It's not technically unlicensed, but you don't need to apply for a license. It's called CBRS. It's in the three and a half gigahertz spectrum. Um, and it's designed for basically private LTE and private 5G networks. Um, it's very cool stuff. We're beginning to play around with commodity uh, uh, SDRs ourselves. Um, and we're sort of in the process of trying to manipulate SRS RAN in order to make this vulnerability work. We didn't have enough time to get a proof of concept running here, but um, that sort of brings the dollar cost value of that research way down for uh, people that want to play around with this stuff. And we're happy to answer any questions or collaborate on anything like that. Yep. So here at the end, I would like to basically sh uh, share some concluding remarks and thank you here. Uh, I have our contacts for both me and Chuck here. And I would like to really thank, uh, give a big thanks to our uh, people in our Milan office who worked on a demo very quickly in a short amount of time that we had for the CFP. And also I would like to give a thank to ATI management or cool boss, uh, Steve McGregory, who basically uh, uh, kind of motivated me and supported me through this. And of course, uh, Chuck, that has been really resourceful in getting the CFP and helping with the many aspects and coming up with applications. He has a very great imagination too. And also IP program manager who basically, with all his hard work, I was able to basically share, talk about the remediation here. And uh, we are going to basically have a, be available for questions here. I was trying to basically hang out for, in the ham radio village a while, but I will be around. And also there is going to be a session, I think at six, in the, at five, yes, at five at the chill out room right behind here. So I would be glad to be around here if you guys have any questions. And thanks for attending our presentation. And I'm really glad for joining DEF CON my first time here. So I'm probably going to be continuing being engaged in this community. I really like what you guys are doing. Uh, and I would like to learn more. Thank you.